Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, those of you who are tuning in live or those of you who are listening offline at a later date, uh, thanks again for listening to this next episode of Meet Aquanics. Uh, we've had two episodes in, in rapid succession due to sh basically scheduling, um, but I'm very happy today to have Nathan Wiebe from Microsoft Research uh, to come in today and spend about an hour of his time to talk about his research. So, Nathan, thanks for sitting down and having a chat. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Simon. It's great to be here. So, generally speaking, um, I, I kind of like to start these things off by basically right. you giving us sort of a bit of a rundown of your biography. You know, how did you get into this? Sure. Um, what sort of enamored you towards quantum computing and quantum information? And ultimately, how did you end up at a place like Microsoft? <laughs> well, you know, I would say that probably my story is uh, typical of most other people uh, uh, in academia in general, you know, in that complete serendipity, really. Um, you know, I, I started out uh, uh, in, in physics, uh, and I was doing quantum chaos. And, well, as many people in quantum chaos start realizing after a while, <laughs> not the greatest job market in the world. So I figured that, you know, because, because I'm going to have to pick something else to do afterwards, I may as well go in and do something else. Now, I looked around, and, you know, this quantum computing stuff, it looked really super boring. So I decided that I was going to go into quantum information <laughs> and <laughs> spent a while uh, working, you know, working with entanglement theory and stuff like that. Not too long, but a, I was kind of, you know, spinning my, spinning my wheels, trying to get somewhere. And I started thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe it might be interesting looking at, you know, simulating quantum, quantum chaotic systems on <laughs> quantum computers. And that sort of naturally started leading me down the path towards quantum computing. And now I would say probably it's my singular obsession. So that's what got me into quantum computing. So correct me if I'm wrong, were you at Waterloo or you at Calgary? I can't remember. Um, I did my PhD in Calgary with, uh, uh, under, under Barry Sanders and Peter Hoyer. Ah, okay. Yeah. And um, I, I did my postdoc in Waterloo under uh, uh, Andrew Childs and Joe Emerson. Ah, so that's where my confusion was. I knew yeah. you were one or the other. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the way I came to Microsoft of it was was really kind of surprising. Basically, what happened is um, I was uh, giving a poster at QIP, and um, um, I was uh, presenting. And to my to my left, there there was a woman there who I'd never met before, uh, who was giving a poster on um, I believe it was on gate compilation. So I started talking to her, and uh, she said that you know she was from Microsoft, and I'm like, oh, I didn't had no idea Microsoft was interested in quantum computing. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we started talking, and then she said that they're interested in simulation, and I said, oh, well, you know, maybe you should try techniques X, Y, and Z. I think you'd be able to do better with those than what, what with what you're presently doing. And well, that naturally led to a visit, job interview, and the rest is history. And so now you're you're basically on staff now. This is this yeah. is a long term position for you. Yeah. So you know, as of uh, I, I got I got the job uh, uh, technically in February. There's some visa issues that got in the way, as they're they want to do. But uh, yeah, I didn't think yeah. Canadians had visa issues when it came to the U.S. You know, you'd think that, but you know, I like joking that you know Canadians are sort of like Cylons. You know, they they <laughs> look like people, they sound like people, but deep down, you know, especially when it comes to immigration law, they're not quite right. Well, considering Seattle's only just across the border, I would have thought, yeah. you know, so this just is give actually, you a pass. Seattle's, for, Seattle's like Vancouver anyway. Yeah, you know, for me, actually, this is the closest to home I've ever worked. <laughs> hey, just in another country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, a, I'm an hour and a half drive away from my family, so it's, uh, it's pretty good. That's amazing. When I was at university, I was an hour and a half away from my family. It didn't even occur to me to be in a separate country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, in many places in Europe, it's, uh, it, uh, that's actually quite possible, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in terms of my, I mean, Microsoft has now sort of turned into, I would say, the behemoth of sort of quantum software. Um, this is something that I've been involved in for a while, but it's, it's sort of been me and a couple of other people right. playing around in it. Whereas, uh, especially your group, QARC, uh, at Microsoft has really turned into, I would argue, the world's leading group um, when it comes to quantum software. Um, so, I mean, this, this obviously has evolved over many, many years, but you guys have sure. gotten quite big now. Yeah. And, you know, and it, it, to be fair, you know, we owe a lot of this to the legacy that I feel was kind of set by the IARPA QCS program mm -hmm. that really 
set the foundation for this and really inspired many people to start taking a look at these issues. And, you know, we've been the beneficiary for of a lot of the learnings that have come out of that. And, um, uh, you know, we've grown quite a bit, I think, since the initial days, you know, when I came here, oh, you know, we were, we were on the order of about four, four researchers. And now, you know, the Quark group alone has, uh, I think, close to about 13. Mm -hmm. So, you know, including postdocs. And uh, that's doing pretty good, I think. And so how does this fold in? Because, I mean, I've, I've noticed sort of, at least from a PR standpoint, a bit of a restructure when it comes to Microsoft research in, in terms of quantum computing. You know, we, we all sort of heard back in the day of Station Q, and this was sort of associated yeah. with the Santa Barbara group. Right. Um, and now, certainly recently, within the, the last year or so, this has now become more encompassing, where sure. Station Q is now the... Santa Barbara group, it's you guys at Redmond, it's the, the group yeah. in Copenhagen, Sydney, Delft, uh, all over yeah. the place, it seems to have come under this entire umbrella of quantum computing at Microsoft. Exactly. I mean, fundamentally, this also reflects, I think, the fact that there's increasingly, uh, there's increasing ties between the uh, things that are going on in our group, as well as Station Q, and the experimental partners that we have. Because, you know, it, the truth is, is that we want to really be able to design a good stack where we're capable of giving, you know, high level quantum simulation or machine learning algorithm that people like me generate and compile all the way down to hardware down mm -hmm. at the bottom. And if we're going to do that, then it really is best, even if it's something as small as a name or a brand, to cut out as many divisions as we possibly can between all of the different people who are contributing to this. So, but everything now is, is basically everything station Q. Or do uh, yeah, you identify yourself something differently? Well, you know, the truth is, is that right now people people identify uh, the way that at least I'm filling out my affiliations at present. This could change in a bit. But mm -hmm. the way that I'm doing it is, you know, Station Q Quark, right? Saying, you know, we're part of this gr uh, greater effort in quantum that Microsoft has. And, you know, we're also part of a smaller effort focusing on quantum software and algorithms. Okay. But uh, so we've heard certain stuff in the middle. Cause, I mean, we'll get onto your specific research in yeah, a second. Sure. Um, but I like to try and start these yeah, things off no. sort of with a, a more of a bird's eye view. Um, we've certainly heard some stuff recently in the media in regards to sort of Microsoft's effort, um, sort of as it's put in the media, which is undoubtedly uh, exaggerated. <laughs> um, is this idea of, of Microsoft putting its eggs in one basket in regards to this uh, model of topological quantum computing. Um, and this is not the same kind of topological quantum computing that I usually talk about on the podcast. This yeah. is intrinsic topological systems, actually very exactly. closely related to the Nobel Prize that was awarded this year. Right. Um, so in terms of, of, of QARC and your specific feelings and your specific uh, ideas of where this is going, I mean, can you talk about this a little bit? Sure. So basically, I mean, you know, Microsoft is committed to developing topological quantum computing where we try to do our uh, all computation in terms of uh, braiding uh, quasi particles, uh, Majorana fermions specifically that are made inside, um, well, yeah, inside a topological device. And the basic idea behind this is that we're really hoping to be able to uh, have intrinsic uh, uh, air protection from the from the use of these devices and we're hoping that we can get very very high gate fidelities naturally out of this and so this of course you know this doesn't unfortunately we don't end up getting a universal set of protected gates out of this mm -hmm. so what this means is this means that at some level what we're doing ultimately is going to end up looking like what a lot of efforts are envisioning we're still going to need magic state distillation we still believe we're going to need error correction on top of this but we're hoping that by getting this technology to work, we can get those gate fidelities low enough that we have some a lot more flexibility uh, in terms of the code that we choose and also in terms of um, just having less air correction overhead than you might need uh, with uh, existing tech. So, I mean, in terms of these sort of what are called intrinsically topologically protected system, they're, they're based on these particles uh, called anions. Um, and that there is quite a large effort, not just at Microsoft, but across the world, to mm -hmm. initially detect these particles, these particles right. that are appropriate for this model of computation. Um, Microsoft has some investment and some effort uh, associated with this, and there are other people already looking at this. Um, in terms of detecting these sort of fundamental particles that can be used for this, this model of computation, mm -hmm. 
what sort of the status does it exist yeah. now? Because yeah, there's yeah, been yeah. papers that have been coming out and people are not sure so, and exactly. The truth is, is that I think, you know, for, for, a long, for a while, the truth is, is that I think I had a lot of skepticism about the uh, existence of these particles. But within the last few years, there started to become a, a much clearer picture that's uh, that's come forward about it. Um, I, 2012, I think, was sort of like the banner year for this, where uh, there was the detection of uh, this zero bias peak, which is sort of the smoking gun experimental evidence that we expect to see for this. Of course, there's multiple explanations that could have come up for this. Was this and, the Delft result? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so since then, really the groups have been going through and one by one checking off all of the possible things that they could think of that could be an alternate explanation for seeing this peak. And so far, well, really, it hasn't been, uh, it, the hypothesis has held up. And so I think that we're starting to see uh, an increasingly clear picture that yes, actually, we likely are producing them. Now, the real, the real test is going to be, can we braid? Can we actually, you know, see a coherent qubit in these devices? And the hope is that, you know, we'll be able to push to that in a not so distant future. And I mean, I know Charlie Marcus is involved with, with Station Q and the guys at Delft are involved with Station Q and Sydney's involved with this. Yeah. Um, has, have you basically got your fingers, whether it's, it's directly with sort of Station Q affiliates or sort of indirectly in terms of collaborations, you've got your fingers in enough pies that you think that uh, the people who can produce these particles are, are looking in this direction of, of quantum computing being the ultimate technology? Well. I think that I think that we've got you know we've got some very good partners uh, for for looking at this, and I think that you know Microsoft does have its fingers in the, in all of these uh, uh, you know in all of these pies, so to speak. But one of the things that I think is very important to look at, also just from the perspective of our group uh, locally, is that the stack that we're developing isn't actually specific just to uh, Myronic qubits. Mm -hmm. Everything is being designed with enough flexibility and enough robustness that if the, if the winds should change and we find that there's something very, another very promising technology out there, say, you know, superconducting qubits have a revolution or say um, silicon based quantum computing finally comes a, a fully of age, then it's possible to take exactly the same learnings that we've done at the moment and adapt them. So this this actually leads in very nicely. I was about to push on more directly uh, to the stuff that you guys are doing at Redmond um, because you really are sort of focusing within this sort of software stack development, this real sort of kind of software engineering yes. side of quantum computing. Um, and as you said, this came out of the IRP QCS program, um, which was very heavily focused on software development and how to control and program quantum computers. Uh, so if you can sort of give us a bit of an overview of sort of what you guys at Redmond are doing broadly in terms of uh, software programs like Liquid and Solid, yeah. um, sure. and more specifically on some of your work in regards okay. to, uh, I think most notably the stuff that I'd like to talk about is your work in um, quantum simulation for Certainly. small molecular systems. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So basically, I mean, what we see at the moment is Liquid is sort of, you know, our our, it's a programming language, it's domain specific for being able to really, first and foremost, it was designed for simulating a quantum computer. So its main purpose uh, is to just get a, get a description in terms of a quantum circuit of an algorithm you'd like to execute and simulate that uh, quickly and uh, you know, in, a in a reasonably memory efficient way. Um, so it's very good with that, but it isn't exactly really what you want in the end uh, if you want to deal with the issue of compiling. For compiling, what we need to do is we need to be able to have a much more robust platform that isn't just designed as a simulator. We really need to have something that blends in uh, the decisions that are going to have to be made, say as syndromes end up coming back from an error correcting code. We need to be able to on the fly have the software stack figure out how to adapt to these things. We need to be able to ideally handle calibration inside this framework. Mm -hmm. And also we need to be able to, you know, do an end-to-end -end compilation all the way down to control. And the the for this we had to architect a completely new platform. And basically what the idea behind this platform, which we call solid, is um, to com uh, compile down into a machine model. 
So very similar to the machine models that were used kind of in the IARPA QCS program, what this does is this describes, you know, kind of an abstract relationship that you have with hardware. And in practice, actually, there's a number of machine models that will probably be used for this. So, you know, you be might begin by compiling into quantum circuit, and that's, you know, one particular machine model, which then compiles into a fault tolerant representation of that, which would be another one. Mm -hmm. And finally, all the way down into the hardware. So we have the ability to compose these models together. And actually, at present, one of the things that we do is we compile into liquid. <laughs> right. So, you know, we just see liquid as another machine model that takes inputs and outputs. And so from that perspective, kind of, you can imagine solid as the glue that holds all of this together. And so when you compile, I mean, do, do you put in sort of architecturally or hardware specific models into this? Absolutely. Um, superconducting systems, ion traps, linear optics, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, exactly. And, you know, there's, it's completely agnostic as to what the underlying hardware actually is. You can program connectivity uh, restrictions into it. You have complete flexibility to specify anything. And so Liquid has been at least partially re released. There, there is a, a version yeah. online for you to download, but if I'm right, it's not the full version. It's, it's like a restricted version? Well, it's... It is actually the full version. There's one minor restriction that we've put in. Um, there's a cap on the number of qubits that the mm -hmm. simula simulator can do. Um, if, you're, if you're running under, you know, I think four or eight gigabytes, somewhere around that regime, you probably won't notice the cap anyways. But, right. um, you know, there is a, there is a, sm there is a slight cap that's, a, that's included in there. But that's the only restriction. And so um, do you, is discussion within, within Microsoft is that Solid's going to be similar, that it's going to be basically open access and people can, can play around with it? Well, at present, there's uh, no plans to publicly release Solid, but there still is some internal discussion uh, inside Microsoft about how Solid is going to, uh, to integrate and be, be potentially distributed, maybe, but at present, there is no plans. Okay. But there is plans for doing Q codes, which is our open source lab uh, control software, which we sort of see right now as being kind of at the bottom of uh, of uh, the solid stack. So hopefully, I am you know even if solid's not released, I imagine that you guys will put out some papers to sort of at least sort of tell us what solid can do. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know that'll be that's the intention. And and with Q codes, there definitely is going to be the ability to uh, to get sort of like the lowest level of uh, of liquid. And we're unlike solid, we're going to make that the the plan is to make that completely one hundred percent open source. So whereas, you know, with solid, what we have is we have, you know, like compiled runtimes, kind of like MATLAB or mm -hmm. Mathematica that people don't have access to, but they can write their own software on top of that. This one is going, uh, Qcodes is entirely open source. So people have the ability to do whatever they want with that. And I think that, you know, I think that there could be some really kind of neat things with that because, you know, we're supporting, Microsoft is supporting this. And uh, uh, I think that by coming up with nice common platforms to get a lot of people's labs to do literally exactly the same protocols will make translating results and testing results between different places um, much easier, which to us is important because we've got labs all you know, that we work with all over the world. And making sure they're doing the same thing in the same ways as, as, you know, was a hurdle that we had to uh, overcome. Well, that was sort of my next question as to, I mean, do you guys partner up with, with um, experimental groups that are not part of sort of the Station Q infrastructure? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we, we, we're a research organization. Mm -hmm. We, you know, if we, will, we will work with anybody who does good research. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've got a number of results that, uh, that we've, I finished up recently with uh, the, pe the people in Jeremy O'Brien's group in Bristol. Um, we're, I'm starting some experiments with uh, uh, Fabio Ciarino in Italy. Uh, we've worked with uh, the um, uh, Chris Monroe's people. And, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of collaboration outside of the traditional partners. And basically, I think we're just happy to do good research. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, I, I think that's sort of like a declarian call to sort of anyone who does have good tech is to certainly get into contact with you guys because you guys have got good software. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it.
So getting more specific onto, onto what you focus on, um, yeah. the, the, some of the more notable results uh, that you put out in the last few years has been related to uh, quantum chemistry and quantum simulation. Mm -hmm. um, one of these ideas that really was the foundation of quantum computing, if you, if you go back yeah. to sort of the Feynman lectures back in the, the early 80s, um, you guys have taken a, a very nice approach to this in the idea of um, doing quantum simulation but trying to restrict it to small numbers of qubits, something that could hopefully be done um, short term, or at least figuring out exactly what can be done in the short term, and something that is potentially commercially and industrially relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you, if you want to try to expand upon sure. this and sort of the stuff that you're trying to investigate yeah. in terms of quantum programming. Now, again, you know, I want to give all due credit to uh, in in this area, especially to the Aspero Guzik group that really kind of pioneered many of the, these ideas and the representations that started us uh, us going on this. But for me, actually, it's very interesting that I ended up finding myself in quantum chemistry because for a long time, I, I never thought that would have happened because, <laughs> you know, I, I remember when the first quantum chemistry papers came out and, you know, I'm a, I'm a, by training, you know, a um, uh, quantum algorithms guy. You spend a lot of time working on abstract quantum simulation algorithms. Mm -hmm. And so I figured as soon as these results came out, well, let's throw it in and see what the actual complexity is of uh, the algorithms. And I ended up finding ridiculous scalings that ended up coming out. You know, like the naive uh, scalings that you ended up getting closer to like end of the 11th uh, from, right. you know, and I, th I sat down it's a while. It's technically polynomial. It, it's polynomial, right? So there is going to be a sufficiently large problem where this gives you an advantage, mm -hmm. but it looks scary. You know, and by optimizing the, the asymptotic scaling, I could get that down to, you know, end of the seventh or end of the eighth, roughly, uh, times some sub-polynomial factors. But still, even that looked really scary to me. So I, I didn't think that there was all that much promise. But... For, for me, the thing that actually enabled this was really liquid. So after coming to Microsoft, you know, I had a conversation with Dave Wecker, you know, our, 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 the, basically the guy who wrote all of liquid. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he was looking at quantum, doing quantum chemistry simulation. And uh, he said, you know, I'm doing this, this simulation and I need to figure out how many time steps I should take. You know, how many should I, should I pick? Because it doesn't, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, let me look at this. Like, yeah, okay, you're going to need probably about 10,000 for that simulation, I believe was the number I gave him. And he's like, oh, okay, that's great. So, you know, he, he ran it and he said, well, it turns out I needed one. And I, I said, what? <laughs> what, one? No, no, you didn't need one. You did something wrong. I'm positive about that. You did something wrong. And, you know, Dave, with full humility, ended up going back and uh, doing it, double checking everything. God damn it, he was right. <laughs> it, it was only one. And so this forced, forced me uh, and many, many other people to go back to many of these, these upper bounds, as well as actually start developing better empirical estimates of how hard simulation actually is. And this, I think, has led to the realization that quantum chemistry may not actually be as hard as uh, people like me at first feared and actually borderline practical as a first uh, generation quantum uh, uh, application. Well, this is an interesting thing because when I first, when I first got into quantum computing back in about 2003 was when I, I first got sort of exposed to it when I was uh, an undergrad. Um, and at that time, especially within Australia, <clears throat> The idea was simulation was a stepping stone to factoring, which was <laughs> at the time sort of, you know, the ultimate goal, yeah. especially with regards to certain three letter funding agencies. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it sort of got turned around. It became sort of uh, common knowledge that, okay, no, simulation is not a stepping stone to factoring. Factoring is a stepping stone to simulation um, because it became much, much harder. Um, and what you're saying is maybe that might not be true. There might be some certain either commercial or industrial applications where maybe we can get away with smaller scale systems, something that's not a factoring machine, it's not an encryption breaking machine, yeah. um, but might still be useful for, for problems that, that really do have commercial and industrial impact. Yeah, 
And that's exactly the thing, because I mean, if you take a look at um, uh, at quantum chemistry as well as material science, you know, a, a shocking amount of supercomputer time is spent globally solving these particular problems. You know, roughly about one third of all supercomputer time is used in solving problems in this space, and quite a few of them could be exponentially sped up by these methods. And that's the sort of speed up that we're probably going to need for a uh, short-term application, especially if we've got slow gates, you know, like you might have for ion traps or other architectures. So, you know, I think that um, basically uh, our, our opinion right now is that likely quantum simulation is going to be probably, especially if something like the Hubbard models uh, mm -hmm. would be um, likely the first real application of quantum uh, simulation. And this could lead to, you know, substantial changes in our ability to, say, model high temperature superconductors or in chemistry, understand cat uh, uh, catalysis that really could change the way that we do a number of things, uh, ranging from fertilizer production to maybe um, one day having an impact even in drug discovery. So this is an interesting thing because certainly the, the stuff that you guys have been doing at Microsoft is, is sort of these quantum chemistry on sort of small molecular systems, things like carbon dioxide, um, ammonia, methane, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, not so much on, on, and we hear this a lot of times about sort of drug discovery and sort of pharmaceutical interests, which, you know, th those molecules are quite large systems. Um, but the stuff that you guys have been doing is focusing on the smaller systems. Um, and that, that still has, certainly in the case of things like ammonia, yeah. um, definitely has, uh, has um, industrial uh, relevance. So let me, one of the things that actually I learned when I, when I started looking at quantum chemistry was that at first I thought, you know, if you're, if you're looking at simulating a large scale molecule for, an, for industrial purposes, that you're going to need, if you've got some massive protein that you need to simulate. I assume that you're going to need roughly, you know, um, a, a, a qubit per uh, spin orbital that you could keep an electron in for the, mm -hmm. this entire molecule. And when you look at that, that's just daunting. You yeah. know, you could need a huge number of logical qubits just to store that. But fortunately, that's not how pe uh, chemists actually address these problems. Uh, what, they, what they do is they, in practice, they use hybrid models. So what they'll do is they'll use a hybrid, um, a molecular mechanical, quantum mechanical model, where what they'll do is they'll simulate the vast majority of this uh, huge molecule using classical molecular dynamics techniques. Mm -hmm. And then they'll look at the parts that they know molecular dynamics is going to fail for. And then they only use quantum mechanics in order to be able to simulate those parts. And so what this is a huge boon for quantum computing because what that means is that means that we can take these sub problems that are hard for existing computers to do and just port that sub problem directly over to a quantum computer and leave the classical computers to do the larger uh, protein around the outside. And so it's quite realistic for us to be able to look at uh, examples on the order of a hundred cu uh, logical qubits uh, where we can actually solve some very, very important things. So these large-scale molecules can still be simulated with, you know, 100 spin orbitals, hence about 100 qubits. Yeah, or at least what I should, should say is that often the hard parts that we know we can't simulate with a classical computer often can be simulated with an order of 1 to 200 uh, logical qubits. Okay, okay. Well, that, that, I must admit, I, I, I don't spend much time yeah. looking at this. Um, so that kind of stuff really, uh, really is interesting if, uh, if that's yeah. what ends up being possible. But again, I mean, in regards to sort of quantum simulation, um, if you were, you know, again, because we, we still have to fold in, unfortunately, error effects, error correction, all this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you were to try to compare it to something like factoring, I mean, <laughs> is it comparable or is it you okay, know, it's orders of magnitude easier? And so this is something that's actually very interesting because if you take a look at factoring versus taking a look at um, uh, quantum simulation, one of the things that ends up coming up is that 
you know, a first guess is when you start taking a look at the crossover points, say you look at the old Van Meter uh, paper that uh, has that famous plot of, you know, Shor's algorithm versus... Rod's going to be very happy that you called it a famous plot. I'll let him know that you said that. He'll be okay. very happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, certainly. I, 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 I live to please Rod. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the um, base, basically... If you take a look at the sizes that you need, you end up coming to the conclusion that you probably are going to need many more logical qubits in order to be able to do an interesting example of factoring, at least to break some of the largest uh, uh, keys that are being used at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, and so most people, when they looked at that, they naively say, oh, well, okay, factoring is clearly going to be a much later application because, you know, we, we, we need 10 to, uh, 10 to 30 times more qubits to be able to do something interesting than with simulation. But the thing that's interesting about factoring is that the number of T gates that you end up needing is relatively, like you take the ratio of logical qubits to like T gates in some sense, mm -hmm. then you need far, far fewer uh, T gates in that context versus the quantum simulation case. So when you start taking a look at it from a fault tolerant level, it actually tends to come out, at least for the examples we looked at for nitrogenase, to be kind of more like a wash that both of them really, for the example we saw, were about the same. So, and this is for doing a full uh, nitrogen A simulation versus factoring of how large a number? Uh, I believe we were looking at factoring 4096 uh, uh, bits. 4096, okay, yeah. so quite a large problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was that's, that's one of the things that we have to pay attention to, that if we're just considering this in logical land, then I think that, you know, the quantum simulation ends up looking perhaps a lot better than it will end up looking when we start having to deal with all the overheads of fault tolerance because it, there'll be a lot of T-gates that are consumed just doing the arbitrary rotations right. that we end up needing there versus you know, the Toffoli networks that you need in the other case, which are relatively parsimonious. Right, right. So, I mean, it's obviously far too early to try and put a bet on them. Um, yeah. But again, sort of, as I said before, this sort of idea of, you know, bef you know, in the early 2000s, simulation was a stepping stone to factoring, then it sort of inverted a little bit. And now, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's sort of coming to be sort of a wash when it comes At to simulation versus something like factoring, which is much more well known. At least for the examples that we ended up looking at, that's how it was seeming. Now, one of the things that I have to also stress is that our uh, analysis of this really was just using some very simple footprint analysis, mm -hmm. similar to you know some of the earlier Fowler results. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, there's a lot, as you, as you no doubt know, there's a lot of complexity that this is just not really paying attention to. Sure. So I, th I think that there's there's a lot more a lot more work that really needs to be done in order to be able to give a final answer on this, and also. It's worth mentioning that there's a number of different ways that we can end up doing the simulation and a number of different trade-offs that we can do in terms of depth, width, and time. And they all end up having um, different, um, uh, different requirements at a fault-tolerant level. Mm -hmm. So I'm really not sure, you know, kind of how to make this comparison in this whole Pareto front, if you see what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, of yeah. things that we want to be good, but... Um, yeah, so it's just it's just complicated, and I think we're going to need some more time to look at it. But if I had to place a bet right now, quantum chemistry is much harder than um, than simulating um, Hubbard models. And well, my, my bet would be we didn't do this comparison, but my bet would be Hubbard models will be done far before either the other two. Do you think things like this sort of Hubbard models or, or these sort of condensed matter models have a space within the commercial? sort of world? Are they these things that people would pay money for? I think that they, well, the question of the size of the market is something that uh, honestly, really, I don't, I don't know so much at the moment. But one of the things that it does, they do open up the potential for a lot of very interesting things. I mean, one of the big things that, you know, we've been struggling with for a very long time is really just kind of quantitatively understanding how high temperature superconductivity works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we were able to somehow learn the, the basic mechanism that enables that, then maybe it might be possible to make, um, to design a high temperature superconductor that doesn't have um, the same, 
the pains of working with ceramics like YBCO has. Mm -hmm. So if we had the ability to make like genuine high temperature superconducting wires, that would change the world profoundly. And I couldn't, couldn't envision, you know, that there wouldn't be commercial applications for that. I completely agree. In fact, uh, one of the major projects here in Japan called the Impact Project uh, has promised sort of, you know, a quantum computing solution to, to the theory behind high temperature superconductivity. Um, it seems, unfortunately, is that nobody seems to have a very good grasp on it. Um, yeah. Not obviously we don't have a good solution to it, but we, we don't even have a good um, procedure for finding the solution. Right. Um, now you mentioned high temperature superconductivity a few times. Uh, is this something that you guys are looking at, something you're looking at either within, you know, your day job or just, you know, if you get <laughs> bored one night? <laughs> <laughs> so really, I mean, I, I'm not looking at the high temperature superconductivity directly. I have looked at Hubbard models and people within our group have spent a lot of time looking at electron pairing mm -hmm. and uh, trying to come up with not just that, but also, you know, good effective classical theories to understand this. So, I mean, it's one thing to be able to, you know, do a calculation and get a number. But something that's, that's come out of Station Q is using this in order to be able to come up with better, you know, classical uh, approximations to this that capture the, uh, the behavior of the, the quantum system. And that's the sort of thing that we might need ultimately to lead to this. But at the moment, this is kind of more like a, a, a goal that's several steps removed from where we actually are at the moment. What we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of build the, the software and the ideas that will one day enable that step. But I don't think we're quite there, you know, uh, to say, all right, here is for sure the Hamiltonian that will address these particular problems and run with it. I think that, you yeah, know. I mean, sorry, in terms of high yeah. temperature superconductivity, this is what I find quite interesting about it. It, it really is this kind of idea that it's sort of, it, it's not like other areas of physics where, we're pretty sure that the theory is right. We just can't calculate it. In high temperature superconductivity, it's we don't even know if the theory is right <laughs> and we can't calculate it. Well, I mean, one, one of the things, I mean, this is, this is starting to go really far into the speculative land. <laughs> yes, yeah. But, you know, so I hope, I hope the viewers will, uh, uh, will indulge me. But one of the things that I think, you know, would be very interesting is that you know, with quantum computers, we also do have the ability to be able to test theories that we can't empirically predict the, the uh, solutions to classically. Mm -hmm. So well, my hope is that maybe this actually might also be able to allow us to learn an effective Hamiltonian model for high temperature superconductors uh, and then use that in order to bootstrap our learnings. So, I mean, in terms of sort of the theory that you've read and, and at least... Yeah. Uh, to a certain extent, whoever experimentally is looking at yeah. this. I mean, do you see that there is at least a foundation to this kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. There, I think there is a foundation. I mean, uh, certainly at some level, like, people know the underlying mechanism. It is just the same, you know, BCS-style pairing that, uh, that uh, ends up leading to superconductivity in low-temperature super, uh, superconductors. But the details of it are total are from from my, uh, from what i've heard not quite there and you know there's models like the you know hubbard model that are believed maybe to qualitatively capture some of the the features but in order to get you know the real quantitative prediction it sounds like there's still some debate but you know i could be wrong i'm not a condensed matter physicist no i mean i'm surrounded by condensed matter physicists here and yeah. i can't get a solid answer from what these people think yeah. Um, so just to pivot a little bit, I mean, if, if we take off the table the Majorana stuff and the anionic stuff and the topological stuff that Microsoft is, is heavily involved with, if you were to sort of take the traditional stuff that's been developed, iron traps, superconductors, linear optics, yeah. um, I mean, do you have a favorite? Do you have something that you <laughs> think is, is at least Truth either is. an interesting technology or a winning technology? Truth is, is that, you know, I like them all. But one of the things I'll say is that I think no matter what, the, the, I, if I was to place a bet on any one technology, um, I would I, I'd bet on linear optics for one mm -hmm. reason, is that that's a, there's so many people who have dismissed linear optics. Well, there's a lot of people who've dismissed it, um, and you know there's been some problems in the past with you know generation of single photons on demand. Dark counts have been a problem for a long time, and a number of other issues. Well, but Jeremy will be very happy to hear this. Yeah, you know I'm I'm somewhat obliged, I guess, in order to be able to say this. But 
I mean, I think there's there's a there's a, a deeper basis for this. Is that, you know, if you're at some point, we're ultimately, I feel, going to want to network quantum computers together, mm -hmm. and photonic interconnects are probably the best way I could imagine doing this. Um, it, it's conceivable you might be able to locally do this with superconducting resonators, but to me, photonic interconnects are almost certainly in the long run going to be part of the whole quantum computing infrastructure. Whether it's going to be what we use on each of our individual computing nodes in order to be able to handle the majority of our, 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 our tasks, I think the jury is still out. But I'd be shocked if it isn't part of the, the whole solution going forward. So you mentioned earlier on that, that you've started doing some work with, with the CQP in Bristol. I mean, I've worked with yeah. Jeremy for, for quite a long number of years now. I mean, is there anything that's sort of on the horizon that you're allowed to speak about? Is there anything <laughs> interesting coming up? Sure. So, I mean, basically, there's a number of things that we've been we've been doing. So, uh, one of the things that I really like about their their setups is that they've got they've got amazing they've got amazing gate fidelities out of this. And one of the, a nice thing that's also uh, thing that's really nice about uh, photonics is that you get measurements out incredibly quickly. So you get just a ton of data flying out of these systems. Mm -hmm. So. For many of the sort of you know machine learning algorithms that I've been I've been running, this is ideal. You know, you what you've got is you've got a huge amount of data for you to be able to learn things about a quantum system, and you've also got you know extremely high fidelity to boot. So you know, for 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 this, it's actually been you know pretty much an ideal uh, ideal platform to test out many of these ideas. And uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a couple of cool results that are going to be coming out about you know using um, a uh, using a, a photonic quantum computer to learn what the Hamiltonian is for an NV center, for example, uh, or you know using a um, sorry, can I ask? Yeah. Maybe this is completely off base. Is this with Alex? Uh, Alex, no, I don't believe it's with Alex. We've got a long author list, I've got a but paper I could be wrong. That Alex Neville's running now. We were doing a characterization protocol on NV centers. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is yeah, this is not maybe, with him. You know, well, I'll have to check the author list. It's pretty long, so you know, maybe he could be on there. Okay, maybe he's not one of the people I'm mainly talking to. Well, no, this is surprising because he emailed me like two weeks ago and said, yeah. you know, I'm writing up the paper now. Huh. Uh, maybe it was just coincidental that maybe, maybe you're on this and I just don't know yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. But um, in in any case, the um, um, yeah. So it's it's very. I think I feel although you know, let's face it, these are very small systems. I feel this is a it's a nice demonstration that we can actually do this for real. That we can use one quantum system in order to be able to learn and characterize uh, another one. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't believe, I, I could be wrong here, but I don't believe anybody's actually shown this before experimentally. So. No, I mean, I mean the, the photonic systems have always been a great test bed for these kind of protocols. And certainly yes. the stuff that, that the CQP and, and the guys at Bristol do uh, have always been great test beds for this. Yeah. If you can keep the qubit numbers low, obviously, because their exactly. photon sources are not great. Yeah. So, I mean, we're kind of getting close to sort of our, our 45 minutes on this. Okay, sure. Um, so, I always try to ask two last questions before <laughs> we sort of sign off. And, and the first one is, and I've offered this to, to other people who've done the podcast, um, give me your sort of 10-year prediction, and we'll come back in a few years' time, and I'll offer a bottle of whiskey, I'll go back over the podcast, <laughs> um, to whoever, whoever gets it closest. Yeah. Um, into what could hopefully be seen sort of in the general realm of quantum technology. What, what would you think you can see in terms of, of marketplace technology in 10 years? And on a side note, what would you hope you could see in yeah. the next 10 years? So there's a number of things that, you know, I, I think we're going to be able to see within the next uh, 10 years. I think that, you know, my hope is that within the next, the next few years that we're going to be able to see uh, a clear demonstration of a quantum memory in um, in uh, at least superconducting qubits, hopefully ion traps as well. Um, I also hope that we'll be able to finally uh, demonstrate a topological qubit within uh, within just the next couple of years. Uh, going further, I, I really do hope that within the next ten years, we'll we'll also be able to uh, show a um, uh, fault to fault tolerant gates mm -hmm. being being executed. I, I I from what it sounds like, we're moving towards that, but you know. Hey, devil's always in the details, right? Yeah, that's true. 
And um, um, I, I also hope within, the, within this time that we'll be able to get a better understanding about what the uh, potential applications and use cases are for quantum annealers. At present, you know, things have been kind of a mixed bag, perhaps leaning more towards the negative side. I really, you know, I'd like, I, I'd like to be able to see a good final answer on this, or ideally being able to find some application that we could actually implement on them with pre-fault tolerant technology. Also, I, I, I think that, you know, within that time scale, it would be wonderful to be able to see the first uh, unambiguous simulation that we can do on hardware, either in an analog or digital fashion, that really can't be simulated efficiently on, or effectively on a classical computer. So these ideas of quantum supremacy that have been talked about in the last couple of months. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's one thing, though, in order to be able to look at quantum supremacy, I think, from the perspective of either randomized gate sequences or from the perspective of a boson sampling. Mm -hmm. But to me, one of the things I really would like to be able to see with this is something maybe like a VQE-style algorithm, giving a actual number that people really care about for, uh, for a quantum chemistry application. And maybe it isn't perfect, but if it, even if it's a slightly better energy than what we can get classically, that would be really cool because it would actually mean something to people rather than you know something more esoteric like a boson sampling experiment. Well, you have definitely been the most optimistic in a number of weeks, <laughs> um, which is great. Uh, you know, after meeting you so many times, I, I'm not surprised, which is wonderful. This is exactly um, what I wanted. There's so many pessimists going on at the moment, so I'm, I'm oh. quite happy to have somebody on that's a little bit more optimistic. Well, thanks. You know, I think, you know, given the experimental strides people have made lately, I can't help but be a little optimistic. I have noticed that theorists are generally more optimistic than experimentalists. Okay, well, maybe that means we're missing something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, or, or they're just hedging their bets in case they can't do it. Yeah. Okay, so I mean that's pretty much rounded out our 45 to 50 minutes. So uh, again, thank you, Nathan, for sitting down and, and having great. great chat with us today and uh, letting us into what's going on at Microsoft and what's going on with you. Wonderful, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, great. Uh, so thanks everyone again for, for joining in. Um, this will be uploaded to our iTunes and SoundCloud accounts, hopefully before I go to bed tonight, although it is quite late now in Tokyo. Um, our next episode uh, next week will be with Dr. Jared Cole again of RMIT University. This will be a special episode um, in the fact that uh, we are launching a new startup company uh, called HVAR, which is going to be a consulting firm uh, based on trying to sort of help uh, certain private investors try to get into the sort of quantum technology space and offering up some services to sort of help them navigate this quite complex uh, new style of technology and we'll be having a discussion with me and Jared who have both uh, founded this startup which will be launching on November 1st so please stay tuned with our social media accounts and we'll link up some stuff and uh, tune in next week and, and see what we're going to try and do in terms of uh, sort of consultancy effort so thanks again. <laughs>